may be the greatest catch I've ever seen in my life. Okay, my dudes, last time we made this video for the running back position, I mean, y'all absolutely killed it. I think we had like four or 500 likes in the first day it was uploaded. So, you know, we are going to come out here and we are going to do the same exact thing with wide receivers. Now, also on a side note, our official 2021 draft guide will be released on the 20th. Okay, so I know we've been getting DMs literally every single day on Patreon going, Mason, is it available? Is it available? Is it available? I promise very soon, guys. I have it completely written, and I just want to make sure all the edits and everything's in line in terms of how it's actually formatted. But yeah, thank you for everybody showing some interest in that. I promise you we'll be getting that out on the 20th. And if you are interested, of course, all of that can be found on Patreon alongside our rankings, alongside me breaking out a podcast of your actual fantasy team, our Patreon Discord chat. There's literally so much over there. But yeah, anyway, let's dive into this video. Let's talk about some of these wide receivers that I don't necessarily want to say all of these guys are being overlooked, but there are some crazy stats that I know you're not going to believe. So of course, you can pause the video. You can go look them up at any time. Everything is available online. It's not like we drew this out of our ass anywhere. And oh yeah, before we get into it, of course, drop a like, subscribe to the channel if you have not for whatever reason. I'd imagine everybody watching this is already subscribed though. And yeah, let's dive into this video. And our first crazy stat we are going to be bringing up is with Devonta Smith. And to be completely honest here with Devonta Smith, I mean, there are so many stats that we can be looking at in evaluating him in terms of just looking at some crazy production. And the first thing I want to address is how we evaluate these rookies coming into the NFL for fantasy. Now, we talked about this in depth with our 2021 Dynasty Rookie Draft Guide that's over 100 pages with historical analysis and a full in-depth breakdown. Now, that's also over there on Patreon. But anyway, just to go through and summarize a very basic explanation of all that historical analysis. At running back, production isn't necessarily that important. What you need to see is you need to see traits, you need to see size, speed, receiving capability in college, and NFL draft capital. Well, at wide receiver, the number one thing that you are actually finding being a predictor of what you're having at the next level is the production that a wide receiver had and what percentage of his offense that he actually accounted for. And Devontae Smith was possibly, I, I just want to say, he was the best college wide receiver of all time last season. Now, of course, you need some context behind this. And the context that we are going to give is the fact that he was top five in college football all time in receiving yards in a season. Now, not only was he top five, but he did this at Alabama. He did this in the SEC. So understanding that it's not like he's playing in some air raid Texas Tech offense in the Big 12, that's so important in actually looking at this production. I mean, you go through and you see that in 2020 at Alabama in the SEC, he averaged 142 receiving yards a game. He averaged over 11 targets a game and almost two touchdowns a game. Guys, that literally does not happen. And like we said, yes, this offense was highly productive, but it's not like it's an air raid offense in the Big 12. I mean, he accounted for 40% of the passing yards at Alabama. That doesn't happen. I mean, occasionally, once a draft class, you'll get a rookie coming out of a D3 school who hits that mark, and then everybody gets all excited, not understanding that he did so, just playing on the field with a bunch of accountants. But no, Devonta Smith was on the field with a ton of NFL talent, and he also accounted for 56% of the passing touchdowns at Alabama. 56% of the passing touchdowns at Alabama went to Devonta Smith. And if you're looking at the Alabama season records, I mean, it's crazy that Devonta Smith has the single season record breaking year where he has 1,856 receiving yards in 2020. The next best wide receivers to ever do this in Alabama, Amari Cooper takes the second spot. Jerry Judy takes the third. Oh, well, we're looking at Devonta Smith back there in the fourth, Jerry Judy fifth. Julio Jones, sixth. I mean, Calvin Ridley down there at eight. There are a ton of talented guys that made this list. Devonta Smith comes on top of them. Not only does he do that, but he has the SEC record for receiving yards in a season. He has the SEC record for receiving touchdowns in a season. Now, this production profile is absolutely ridiculous. Now, where this translates to fantasy this upcoming year, we have to be completely transparent and saying, yes, we are above consensus on Devonta Smith, but 
I mean, I can't come out here and I can't act like he's going to be a top 24 wide receiver right away. A big problem is he's going to an offense where, yes, I love Jalen Hurts in fantasy, but the main reason we love Jalen Hurts is be, we believe that he can be that next to Lamar Jackson. He can be that guy that averages over 60 rushing yards a game. And we know you have such an elite ceiling if you can hit those marks, but you're not necessarily excited about Jalen Hurts from a passing volume standpoint. So with Devontae Smith, I can't come out here and I can't act like he is going to be that top 24 wide receiver right away. But we do have him at wide receiver 35 currently in our rankings, directly ahead of Jerry Judy, Will Fuller, Michael Gallup, Michael Gallup, a player we'll get to at the end of the video, and Curtis Samuel. So some other wide receivers that I really like, we do have Devonta Smith higher than, and this is ahead of ADP. I mean, you have a ton of drafters being worried about Smith, and I will say there is one big red flag that you're hearing everybody bring up over and over and over again, and that's the fact that he's six foot tall and only weighs 170 pounds. And now, yes, I, I can't escape the fact I can't lie about it. No, we have never seen a wide receiver at the NFL level find success at this size. It simply hasn't happened before, but I mean, this is the best college receiver of all time. So I think you take the good with the bad here. And I think where we can, we are definitely gonna be trying to get Devonta Smith as our wide receiver three, wide receiver four in drafts, because if Jalen Hurts does come through with some passing volume, I mean, Smith could easily run away with 22, 23% of this team's targets. But now let's go over, and I honestly kind of have to admit something here. And I'm going to admit that Antonio Brown was a lot better last year than I gave him credit for. So I kind of got annoyed last season. Y'all know during the football season, we live stream every single night answering questions. And when Antonio Brown was coming back halfway through the year, I mean, I was getting questions over and over and over again. Mason, who do I want in fantasy? Antonio Brown or Keenan Allen? Mason, who do I want? Antonio Brown or Allen Robinson? And I'm sitting here going, guys, Antonio Brown literally is nowhere near that range. I would be surprised if he's a top 24 wide receiver. There's no way in hell you can be trading elite assets away from him. I thought Antonio Brown was going to be a clear tier behind both Mike Evans and Chris Godwin coming into this offense. And I thought he was mainly brought in, not going to be a full-time player. And instead, you were going to just see him used more so in the playoffs and kind of as a role player on this Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense. But that didn't happen. I mean, Antonio Brown came in and he was productive right away. Now, no, he was not living up to the standards that some crazy people thought he was going to, just casual football fans that didn't understand that he was out of football for so long. They thought he was going to step back into what he was in Pittsburgh. Of course, he didn't live up to that, but he was much better than I thought he was going to be, where you're looking at him, and he averages 14.6 points per game as the wide receiver 24 in fantasy last year. He does this with decent volume. He does it with decent efficiency, 60 receiving yards a game, seven and a half targets a game, and half a touchdown a game as well. Now, if we go through, and I know you hear wide receiver 24 and you don't get that excited, but I really want to give some context behind this. So let's look at the wide receivers that finished directly ahead of Antonio Brown. But more importantly, let's look at the guys that only scored one point more or less than Antonio Brown. So a lot of these guys scored half a point more per game than AB. I mean, nobody here scored more than a point more than Antonio Brown on a per game basis. Okay, so let, let's get up this list. You have Mike Evans, Brandon Cooks, Robert Woods, Brandon Ayuk, Terry McLaurin, Deontay Johnson, and Amari Cooper. Now, Juju Smith-Schuster also comes in at that list. You know, I always have to get my man Juju in there. But regardless, the point here is Antonio Brown actually coming in and providing value right away after a year off of football in that same tier of wide receiver twos that are being drafted significantly higher than him in fantasy this year. And a big thing that I want to cover is I know a lot of people are going to be thinking, well, Mason, it's because Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, they dealt with injuries all last season. I mean, maybe Chris Godwin missed three games when Antonio Brown came back and Antonio Brown was able to slide in as the wide receiver two on this offense. Well, no, that's not the case at all. Surprisingly, Antonio Brown, when he came back, Chris Godwin and Mike Evans, neither of them missed a game. Every single game played by Antonio Brown last year, he was the wide receiver three on this offense. And if we look at the difference in production, when Antonio Brown did play between him, Mike Evans, and Chris Godwin, honestly, the difference wasn't that large. 
I mean, you had Mike Evans with 17.4 fantasy points per game. So yes, he was a clear tier ahead of these two guys. And he did so with ridiculous touchdown volume, which we know, I mean, that's something you can get excited about with the upside of Mike Evans. But Chris Godwin, 15.7 compared to Antonio Browns at 14.6. I mean, they were all kind of neck and neck here. And obviously you're getting Antonio Brown at a significant, significant discount. And right now we are higher than Antonio Brown than consensus with our rankings. And we have him at wide receiver 40. So if you're drafting Antonio Brown this year, you can literally be higher on him than most people and still be coming away with him as your wide receiver four. And this is all to go without saying, what happens if something happens to Mike Evans? What happens if something happens to Chris Godwin? All of a sudden, Antonio Brown steps up into the wide receiver two role on this team. And I think we can all assume that his target share, his overall numbers are going to drastically go up in that case. So Antonio Brown really liked the value this year. Now, our next stat we are going to be bringing up is DeAndre Hopkins is definitely the safest wide receiver we have seen in fantasy in I don't know how many years now. I mean, you go through right now with DeAndre Hopkins and you look at him since 2015. Now, 2015 is significant because this was his third year in the NFL. We know back in 2015, that's usually when you had to wait three years to break out when you were coming in at 2013. Now, obviously, it's a little bit different now. The case of a Justin Jefferson, the case of an Odell Beckham Jr., the case of these rookie wide receivers that will break out right away, but that's not how it used to be. So let's look at year three for DeAndre Hopkins and Starting in year three, this is a player that averages 20.7 points per game. Now in 2016, he goes through and he has a massive down year, but there's a clear explanation. We'll get to that at the end, 12.3. But if you ignore 2016, in 2015, he averages over 20 points a game. Then 2017, over 20 points a game. 2018, over 20 points a game. And then 18 points a game, both in 2019 and in 2020. And what's crazy here is, I mean, he did this with not having great quarterback play at all. I, I know recent memory suggests that, I mean, DeAndre Hopkins was a quarterback. I mean, I'm sorry, DeAndre Hopkins was always playing with a great quarterback in Deshaun Watson or Kyler Murray, but that was not the case. I mean, we go back to that first season we mentioned when he averaged 20.7 points per game in 2015. This year, the starting quarterbacks for the Houston Texans were Brian Hoyer with nine games, Ryan Mallett with three, TJ Yates at two, then Brandon Whedon got a start at the same time. Now, he still came out with that carousel of quarterbacks and averaged over 20 points per game. Now, in 2016, this was the down year. This is when DeAndre Hopkins came out, played all 16 games, was completely healthy, and dropped down to 12 points a game. It was horrendous. But the reason was Brock Osweiler started 14 games for this team. Brock Osweiler, possibly, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, the worst starting quarterback in the NFL over the past decade. If y'all remember that 2017 NFL offseason, I mean, you actually had the Houston Texans trading Brock Osweiler to the Cleveland Browns, and they added a second round pick for nothing. They just had to get the contracts off the books. They literally went, Brock Osweiler, you are so bad that you are worth negative draft capital. We're going to have to pay a second to get rid of you. I mean, that's how bad of a starting quarterback he was. Now, in 2017, he comes out, and yes, this is when Deshaun Watson's drafted. But let's remember, Deshaun Watson tore that ACL. So you really had such a small window with him where he actually only started six games. And then you got 10 starting games from both Tom Savage and TJ Yates. So yeah, I mean, you have three years of good quarterback play for DeAndre Hopkins. And beyond that, you really have only horrendous, horrendous quarterback play. And on top of this, not only is he elite in the points per game that he is giving you, but if we really wanted to skew this stat, of course, we're not going to do this because we only look at points per game because that's what matters. But you can look at his point totals and you are just going to see a wide receiver that finishes at one, 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 because this is a guy that has missed one game throughout his entire NFL career. DeAndre Hopkins has missed one game while coming into the NFL in 2013. Just try to remember where you were in 2013 and then go through playing the NFL every single year and miss one game. No, DeAndre Hopkins, literally like the only wide receiver that can see that volume and can stay that healthy. Okay, so now this is a storyline that honestly I have not heard anybody talk about and it's kind of ridiculous, but Devontae Adams in 2020 just possibly put up the best wide receiver season of all time for fantasy football. 
I mean, you go through and in 2020, he posted 25.74 points per game. Now, I know that he did this off of a lot of touchdown volume, which of course regresses season to season, but let's try to put some context into how impressive this year was from Devontae Adams. And I understand that a lot is kind of circulating the situation. You have Aaron Rodgers not happy in that situation, probably going to get out of there if he can. But with Devontae Adams in that 25.7 points per game, he literally broke fantasy leagues. I mean, if you take out the week where he left at the very beginning of the game due to injury as well. So in week two, I believe he only scored like seven points that game, but he left early due to injury. And if you take that out because he didn't play the full snaps, I mean, he actually averages over 27 points per game. Now, if we go through and if we look since 2015 at the leading wide receivers in points per game, none of them come close to this. In 2019, when we all remember Michael Thomas being a league breaker, being a league winner, he averages 23 points per game. Nothing compared to the 27.2 that you had from Devontae Adams. Then in 2018, Devontae Adams was actually the wide receiver one. He averages 21 points a game. In 2017, it was Antonio Brown with 22. In 2016, it was Antonio Brown with 20. And in 2015, it was Antonio Brown with 23. So you could make the argument that in recent memory, Devontae Adams just posted the best fantasy wide receiver season of all time. I mean, this is equivalent to Christian McCaffrey in 2019. This is equivalent to Lamar Jackson in 2019, Patrick Mahomes in 2018. It's such an outlier. And in our most recent high stakes redraft flock draft, I actually just drafted Devontae Adams at the 207. Now, I know a lot of that is to do with Aaron Rodgers, not necessarily having his situation set for this upcoming year. And of course, if Rodgers does not play in Green Bay, Adams is going to be taking a significant hit. But if you are drafting right now and you are not scared of the downside and you are only shooting for upside, which is how I play fantasy, I mean, if you can get Devontae Adams in the mid to late second, literally nothing is crazier than that. Okay, so now let's go over and let's talk about some crazy DJ Chark stats here. I mean, with DJ Chark, okay, so let's go through. And obviously in 2020, he finishes as a wide receiver four on a points per game basis. It was disgusting, but he had some of, if not the worst quarterback play in the entire NFL. What I really want to focus in on is DJ Chark's 2019 season. Because if you look at our rankings over there on Patreon, you're going to find that we are significantly higher than consensus on DJ Chark. And yes, I was worried about this team drafting wide receiver going into the NFL draft for Dynasty. So I was a little bit off of Chark, but somehow they avoid wide receiver in the NFL draft. And all of a sudden, DJ Chark falls in fantasy value based on LaVisca Chenault getting a ton of buzz in camp. And we have been on record all offseason now, especially in Dynasty. I mean, earlier in the offseason, DJ Chark was being drafted rounds ahead of LaVisca Chenault. I was screaming on a mountaintop that that shouldn't have been happening, that they're wide receiver 1A and wide receiver 1B, and they should be going neck and neck. And now, I mean, people are trying to tell me that I'm too low on LaVisca and he needs to be ahead of DJ Chark. Well, I mean, we were the ones to call that ADP correction. But regardless, that's kind of besides the point here. I just want to kind of justify why DJ Chark is going to be ranked ahead of LaVisca Chenault for us this upcoming season. And if we look at that 2019 year, so DJ Chark's second year in the NFL, keep in mind, he was playing in a disgusting situation for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I mean, he goes through and he averages 15 fantasy points per game. Now, this is very deceiving because if you look at the last two weeks, DJ Chark really was suffering with an injury that he left week 13 early with. So if we just go through and we just take out those two weeks, ignore the injured weeks because they're such outliers and you can really see that they don't fit the sample at all. I mean, this gets bumped up to 16 and a half fantasy points per game for DJ Chark in 2019. Now, if we look at where that would have stacked up, that would have stacked up as the wide receiver eight and the wide receivers that would have finished directly ahead of him would have been Devontae Adams and Cooper Cup. And the wide receivers that would have finished directly behind him would have been Keenan Allen, Julian Edelman, Allen Robinson, and Tyreek Hill. I mean, you had a truly special season from DJ Chark in his sophomore year in the NFL with Gardner Minshew at quarterback. And this is a player that is being drafted behind Calvin Ridley, which he should be, Cortland Sutton, which he shouldn't be, and DJ Moore, which yes, he should be. But regardless, I mean, those are all wide receivers from that same draft class. And if we go through and we look at how they stacked up compared to DJ Chark in their second years in the NFL, and this is mainly important for Cortland Sutton, and this is why I want to be highlighting this. In the case of Cortland Sutton, 
Cortland Sutton was the wide receiver 28 in fantasy his sophomore year, the same year as DJ Chark. Sutton was actually an older wide receiver. Now, what you're finding in fantasy drafts is Sutton is going ahead of DJ Chark. While in Denver, I mean, you actually have added competition with Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, and Noah Fant going into year three. Compared to in Jacksonville, while yes, you have LaVisca Chenault going into year two, the difference is you have Trevor Lawrence coming into this situation. It's going to be drastically better. And at the same time, you've already had DJ Chark outscore Cortland Sutton by a massive amount, regardless of if you're looking at the injured weeks or not. So I just mainly want to bring this up and saying, if you're currently drafting Cortland Sutton over DJ Chark, that is horrendous. We have DJ Chark at 25 right now in our rankings. And we have Cortland Sutton like five spots behind that. You're not going to find that in ADP, but I really think that's how it should be. Now, our last stat we are going to be bringing up is going to be a real brief one just because we have said this in videos before, but it's really interesting. So I definitely want to cover it. Michael Gallup also had an incredible sophomore year in 2019. He was in that same draft class. And here with Michael Gallup in 2019, he comes out and he averages eight targets a game, 79 receiving yards a game. And if you compare this to Amari Cooper in that same offense, and this is a full year of Dak Prescott, Amari Cooper actually averages seven and a half targets a game and 75 receiving yards a game. So Michael Gallup in his second season in Dallas outproduced Amari Cooper in a full year with Dak Prescott. Now, of course, you're going to be finding a massive difference in value between these two wide receivers. And I agree with you. Yes, Amari Cooper should be ranked before Michael Gallup. I am not saying that that should be flipped. What I'm saying is I'm saying Michael Gallup should be a lot closer to both C.D. Lamb and Amari Cooper than he currently is. And now the main reason why you're finding such a big gap in value is because you go through and you look at what these wide receivers did with Dak Prescott in 2020. And Michael Gallup was used primarily as the field stretching route while he was the wide receiver 43 with Dak Prescott compared to Amari Cooper at 11 and CeeDee Lamb at 16. And obviously both Amari Cooper and CeeDee Lamb are much better wide receivers than Michael Gallup. But that's not the point here. The point here is Michael Gallup is a lot closer to these guys than a lot of people want to believe. I mean, if you look after the bye week last year, I mean, week 10 and beyond, Michael Gallup was the wide receiver 36 in fantasy ahead of C.D. Lamb and only five spots behind Amari Cooper. So while yes, I am completely fine with drafting Amari Cooper and both C.D. Lamb in drafts right now, I just think that if you're getting Michael Gallup in round 13, which is sometimes happening here, this, that's horrendous. I think this offense is going to be a lot closer to a wide receiver 1A, wide receiver 1B, and a wide receiver 1C than people are actually giving it credit to be. But yeah, thank you, my dudes. I really hope y'all enjoyed this video. Of course, go down there, drop a like, leave a comment, subscribe to the channel. And if you have any other questions, please reach out to me on Patreon. I'd be happy to answer anytime. I'd be happy to get you that draft guide. I'd be happy to get you out of podcast, breaking down your own fantasy team. But yeah, thank you, my dudes. And I'll see y'all with the video tomorrow. We've gotten a ton of new members joining the flock. Thank you, Grind for Gold, Devin, Bungified, Brian, Brody, Victor, Chris, Grant, Trevor, and David. Thank you, my dudes.